So we're here to talk about Randolph Avenue reconstruction. I'm Beth Engum. I work for Ramsey County Public Works, and I'm the project manager for this project. We're going to go through um, a short presentation just to tell you the basic information on the project. So we're not exactly sure when this roadway was built because back when they build roadways like this, they kind of evolved over time, potentially with just putting oil on dirt and then you know, paving over it as time went on. Um, we expect to find some interesting stuff potentially underneath the pavement. Um, it was overlaid in 2002, and I think most of you are probably aware it's not in the best shape. Um, so we're thinking it's not a good use of money to overlay it again. It's time to reconstruct it. So in terms of the type of improvements we're looking at, we're looking at reconstructing the roadway um, in its entirety. So basically starting from the property owner side of the sidewalk and moving in towards the street and working over to the other property owner side of the other sidewalk. So that's uh, roadway reconstruction, which includes everything in between, like I said. Um, drainage improvements, we'll be replacing the storm sewer that's out there today and all of the curb. Um, some utility improvements we'll do while we're in there. Um, water, sanitary sewer, and some private utility improvements. And then also adding some lighting. So we'll talk more about each of those categories of improvements. So here's um, a typical section. It's actually the way the roadway looks today, and it's actually what we're proposing to reconstruct the roadway with. Um, so we're just gonna maintain what's out there, which is one lane of traffic in each direction, and then on-street parking on both sides of the street. So the curbs will generally stay where they are today. So there's a lot of reasons why we're proposing to maintain the existing typical section. Um, the beautiful trees that are out there number close to 200. Um, if we get much past the existing curb towards those trees in the boulevard, we'll be you know, potentially damaging the root structure and we don't want to do that. So we're, our goal of our project is to minimize any impact to trees. Um, we'd, we're interested in maintaining the parking since it is uh, a mixed um, bag of land uses out there, both residential and commercial. So we're looking at keeping the parking generally um, that is there today. And we want to balance both the roadway use and the pedestrian environment of the corridor since it is you know, a corridor people walk down to get from point A to B along the corridor. Um, in order to do what we want to do with putting the curbs back where they are today, we need a variance. Um, this roadway is designated as a county state aid highway, which means we get tax dollars to maintain and repair the roadway. Um, and with those tax dollars, there's requirements for minimum design standards. And for a roadway with a lot of traffic on it, like Randolph, which the classification of a lot of traffic in this case is over 10,000 vehicles per day, we are supposed to maintain a minimum 10-foot parking lane. Um, we actually are proposing a 9-foot, which is really what's out there today, even though you don't see the parking lane striped. We have 11 feet in, in the travel lane and 9 feet in the parking lane. So in order to maintain that, we have to just get a variance of 1 foot on that parking lane. Um, so in addition to those reasons to maintain the section, obviously there's other reasons where widening you know, becomes problematic and that is due to the narrow roadway width, or excuse me, the narrow right of way width. We only have about 66 to 80 feet to work with. And if we get outside that right of way width, we're you know, into impacts pretty quickly since the corridor is built up right on the outside of the right of way. So there are a couple exceptions um, to where we wouldn't be maintaining the existing curb width. And one of those is at Hamlin Avenue. We're proposing actually to widen that just a little bit. I think it's in the or on the order of four feet or so, so a couple feet either side, in order to add left turn lanes. Um, so we want your feedback on that. Obviously, there's heavy left turning movement at, at Hamlin. Um, but the trade-off for adding left turn lanes in each direction would be losing parking on one side. So we were pushing, actually proposing to push the, um, the roadway or the traffic a little bit to the north 
Um, so we would be maintaining the bus stop on the south side um, and then pushing traffic and getting in that extra lane in order to add left turn lanes. And if that's something that sounds like everyone is on board with, um, we would go ahead and make the changes necessary to the traffic signal to accommodate that left turn lane, obviously. The other exception is Lexington Avenue. I'm expecting to hear quite a bit about Lexington Avenue tonight because it is a really busy intersection. Um, so we'd like to hear you know, what you guys are experiencing out there. Um, knowing that as soon as we step outside the right of way, we have some pretty significant impacts. Um, I actually, on both the east and west side of the intersection with um, homes pretty close to the right of way, um, Trader Joe's infrastructure that was recently put in pretty close to the right of way, and then just even on the uh, southwest side, the large retaining walls, and then the, the big hill that the apartment building is on. So we're looking at different possibilities there. Nothing's really decided on right now, but we're gonna look at that from a standpoint of what's the benefit um, versus the cost of certain improvements. So I mentioned we'd be doing drainage improvements while we reconstruct the road, and here's a picture showing why we might need to replace the curb along the whole corridor. Um, so we're gonna do that, and then we're gonna replace all of the storm sewer. Um, it was put in at different times, some more recent than others, but some going back to like the 70s. Um, so we would be redesigning the storm sewer to meet those state aid standards that I mentioned, and we'd also need to meet infiltration requirements um, set by the watershed district. So those can be in the form of rain gardens, um, underground detention facilities. We obviously have not a lot of room to work with, so we're thinking that it would likely be underground. Um, and those are just storm water features. You probably wouldn't even know we're there, but we do have to deal with meeting those requirements. And then I mentioned utility improvements. The water main that's under Randolph is um, maintained by St. Paul Regional Water Services, and we've met with them to talk about the infrastructure they have and the improvements that they'd like to take care of while we're in there. Um, there's some main crossings on side streets. It's uh, four different side streets that have mains crossing Randolph, and they would go ahead and replace those um, areas within the project limits. They wanna replace all the fire hydrants within the corridor, and then there's about 86 lead services that they're required to replace um, when roadway work is done, which the county likes because we don't wanna have to go into our new roadway after the project is finished. Um, and those uh, lead services will have some tree impact. So we've noted those areas on the layout. Um, so you'll see some X's through trees where we've, we've located the services and we think that they're gonna be too close to the trees to save the tree. I might as well mention at this time too, there's other X's on the layout that represent trees that the forester for the city of St. Paul have deemed you know, trees that are not healthy. So I think there's a handful of those, but for the most part, um, we're trying to, like I mentioned, um, maintain the trees that are out there in good shape. And then there's always private utility work to be done with roadway projects. We've got um, Excel Gas and Electric, CenturyLink has a few lines within the project limits, and Xfinity. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of that work concurrent with the project and potentially some of it ahead of the project. Um, sanitary sewer improvements, a lot of the sanitary sewer is very old, so we'll be rebuilding um, some of the top sections of the manholes for sanitary sewer that tend to fall apart when you get into them, um, when you're rebuilding the road and you're subcutting to get in the sand and the rock beneath the pavement. Um, so we'll be rebuilding those sections and replacing castings. Um, it's to be determined, but uh, the city has you know, decided to take a look at the condition of the sanitary sewer and they'll probably be lining a lot of it, which is a trenchless technology, um, but they'll be doing that in some areas to be determined. And then the opportunity presents itself to replace some problematic services within the right of way. Um, those are actually owned by the property owner so it would be at the owner's request and expense that that section of their service be replaced with the project. 
And obviously there's an advantage with having our contractor out there capable of doing the work and doing it on a, you know, a larger scale. So the city allows that with their projects and we're gonna do the same with the county's project. So I have some more information about that um, if you'd like to talk to somebody about potentially doing that. So just a little bit more information about sanitary services. Um, you can see just a typical section here of if you cut the roadway um, and you are looking at, you know, from center line of the roadway to your home, what that service looks like. Um, sanitary usually runs down the middle of the street, which is largely the case on this project. Um, so you can see that the section of the service that we're talking about is the one that connects at the main in the middle of the street and goes to the property owner's property line or the end of the right of way. And then I mentioned lantern style lighting. This is a picture of the city's um, typical lantern style lighting that they've been adding in other locations around the city. So the lighting would look something like this. Um, we don't have those locations of the lights proposed on the layout that you see in the back of the room, but it's generally will be staggered, so it'll be on both sides of the street at some spacing interval, you know, between the trees that exist out there today. So the funding for the project is those state aid funds that I mentioned um, from the roadway being designated as a CASA. That's where the bulk of the money will come from in order to do the project. And then some other project money will come from the city in the form of, um, I guess, local funds that they have, but also in the form of city assessments for roadway and lighting. Um, and the city can answer more questions about how that works and we'll obviously have more information at a future open house when we've gotten further into the actual design of the project. And then we also were able to receive some cooperative agreement funding from the state and that's specifically for pedestrian improvements at I-35E where the ramps intersect with Randolph. So the schedule for the project, we're really right now in the preliminary design phase, so we've gathered a bunch of information in order to present this information to you today and to create the layout which is in the back of the room. Um, the variance uh, process is probably the next big step for us. We need to submit that information to MnDOT by the 1st of December, and then the committee, um, which is made up of some professionals in the community like city engineers and county engineers, they'll be reviewing that request at a December 19th meeting, I believe, and we'll get the answer right there whether they grant the variance. And that would be kind of the go ahead in our minds to get going on final design, because we have a lot of details to work out with the one mile roadway project. Um, since we will be looking at beginning construction in the spring of 2015. And I mentioned that second open house, we're expecting to come back to the public in the summer, potentially the spring of next year, with more information that we don't have right now, like construction phasing and how we're gonna stage the project. Um, right now, it's, I'd say it's likely that we'd be looking at a two-year construction duration just because it would be hard to get it all done in one Minnesota construction season. Um, but that's still to be determined. So like I said, we're gonna be around here and can answer any specific questions you have about your home. But if you have a question you think the whole group might wanna hear the answer to, we can go through some of those. Oh. Let's go with the woman back there first and then I'll catch you. Uh, in the summertime, you know, they have a baseball game at, at the playground out here, and they park the baseball game, of course, along Randolph, and then they have two lanes of traffic, buses and trucks, and then the fire department goes through. I think they ought to eliminate in some places, perhaps, Consider it now eliminating some of the parking uh, because 
I mean, there's just no place for the cars to go when the fire trucks come through. And it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. It's a hazard for everybody. And when you take out those um, cast curves, cement, they're, they're cut out of long stone. Are you going to leave them around so we can take them home if we want to? <laughs> we could write that into the contract that the contractor can see them, maybe. But um, we don't really want to do that. Great landscaping. Yeah, that's actually something that as a property owner, you could certainly talk to the contractor and see if they'd let you do that. But think about the traffic, the, the fire, the poor fire department. Oh, God, and the ambulances, they have the worst time around here. Because this is a really busy, busy street and the trucks and everything. We can talk about areas, if there's specific areas you think that's more of a problem um, than others. We can look at the layout and see if there's some places maybe we should consider that. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. I just have a question. It is seeing that uh, the width of the roadway is not being changed at all besides four feet on Randolph. My own Cordy supermarket, mm -hmm. by the way, Steve Cordy. Um, and I was just wondering, is there a reason why we have to go with complete reconstruction? Are the sewers in that bad of shape that they need to be redone? Or why couldn't we just save the money? Like you said, save us, all our business owners and residents here, some, some money on assessments and overlay it. The last overlay has lasted for 10, 12, 14 years. If, if the stuff needs to be replaced, that's, that's one thing, but if you really don't need it and you get money from the state to do this project, and just as long as you got the street torn up, let's replace it, it seems silly to me. It's like me replacing the freezer at the store that works just fine. But I found some money, so I'm just gonna replace it. Well, we're rebuilding things that make sense to rebuild while we're in there, so I, maybe I didn't phrase that. Yeah, the storm sewer is needed, yeah. You know, the sanitary, for example, the tops of those sanitary manholes, they really do start to fall apart when you get in there and you're digging down several feet to rebuild your subgrade. But we don't touch the bottom of those manholes because they're just fine. We don't get down that far. And the city is going to be televising the sanitary sewer to see whether it needs to be lined. Um, they've been doing that in a lot of other areas where the sewer is as old as it is here. So they won't do that lining unless that's necessary. Okay. Ma'am? Yes, um, a few years back when um, Trader Joe's was uh, going to be built, um, it didn't seem when, when that was being planned that they, the city or whomever listened to the residents about how is that going to impact people picking up children from school from one end to the other. I mean, from St. Paul Academy down, we've got a lot of schools. And the buses, um, you know, line up, and everyone trying to get out of the way. I, I just don't know if people can look, think about um, the safety of the children. That's a big concern for me, and I don't know if that's being addressed. But I feel that that's an important um, feature. I'm also concerned for the wonderful businesses that we have along Randall. How long are they, you know, will we not be able to get to Cordes? I have to real concern to our family. And we don't even live directly in this area any longer. But we shop here. And I, I feel as if the businesses really need to have a voice and, and to be, um, contribute their feelings and what are their needs. Oh, I'm too concerned about children. Let's start with your second concern. That is something we're concerned about too, because I know you can't afford for an entire summer or two summers to not be able to get to the businesses. So that's something I talked to Steve about, and that we're going to have to figure out the details. 
because there's opportunities to take maybe a few blocks at a time and reconstruct those and put requirements on the contractor when they have to have those done. So we're certainly not gonna let the contractor rip up several blocks at a time and just leave it undone all summer. So we'll have interim completion dates for the contract where he has to have certain blocks done within a certain time frame. And even within those blocks that he's working on, say it's three blocks at a time, we'll look at whether we can have you know the cross streets passable during construction. So that's all depends kind of on like the intersections are kind of the busy areas with private utilities and that's sometimes where the bigger storm sewer structures are. So we'll look at doing that you know, wherever we possibly can. And then with respect to your concern about safety, you know, we do have the crash history along the corridor and we did take a look at that and we are keeping that as a consideration for when we're doing things like asking for a variance um, and when we're doing things like making sure that we maintain a boulevard width that keeps people walking along Randolph, you know, not right on top of the roadway. So we are thinking about those types of things during design. One of the things we're adding at all the signals is um, audible pedestrian signals where they don't exist today and the countdown timers. So all the signals will generally remain as they are, um, except for maybe at Hamlin where we'd have to add a signal head if we took, make you know left turns. But those pedestrian improvements at all the intersections that are signalized will be a nice improvement too. Thank you. Sir in the red? A couple of quick ones. Um, how does this the schedule? I work in downtown St. Paul, so I'm up and down Randolph twice a day to get to 35E. I can take 94 if I need to, but I understand. I think in 15, is that when the Snelling Selby thing happens and the Snelling I 94 overpass reconstruction? They're redecking that. Uh, will all of these different projects affect traveling from? Mac for Grove, right, in the whole project. Okay. Two big projects coming up, Snelling and Selby and the Snelling 94. Yeah. Um, I'll have to look into the timing of those, but we'll take that into consideration maybe when we phase the project. Uh, and then whatever light you can shed on what assessments would be for, for this. I don't know if the city's prepared to talk about that. <laughs> Dan Hock with the City of St. Paul, Street Design and Construction. Uh, we haven't even established the rates for 14 yet. Uh, I'm working on that now, but I'm estimating on the order of about $100 per front foot, and that would include a new street and street lighting. And it will be the same for all the projects in 2015. Okay, or when they did my second J, that's, you can pay that amortized over X amount of time. Over 20 years. 20 years. Simple interest. The gentleman that just walked in, is that you? Yeah. Um, do you know what the present uh, traffic count is on uh, Randolph? Um, it's a little bit heavier, I believe, on the east end of the project limits, but it is um, between 13,700 vehicles per day and 15,600 vehicles per day. Okay, and then, uh, is it common to uh, do maybe two blocks at a time at detour, or versus the whole road closed down? Yeah, that's kind of what we're thinking would be more friendly to people that drive through the area, maybe not drive through the area, but definitely for people who live on the corridor, is to not rip up the whole road for two years. So we are looking at phasing, and in my previous experience, usually that would first be dictated from a drainage standpoint just because you need to make sure that you've got somewhere for the water to go while you're doing construction. But we would take other things into consideration like bus stops and cross street, you know, availability of keeping cross streets open, businesses, things like that. And what would the traffic count drop to that uh, uh, project like this? That's a good question. I don't know. Would be a good bit. This is very important. I know that's I've got, I've got five city lots for my store, and he's going $100 a, a foot. 
That means disruption of my business, which is going to cost me 25 to 50 percent, is what I'm considering. Because the road's going to be closed, and there's way too many options for groceries. They can go anywhere in town, and you can go to Menards for crying out loud and get groceries. So here it's going to cost me $20,000 to interrupt my business for an assessment that I don't feel that we need. I think this project is a big waste of money, and it's a big waste of our money at this time. When you're looking at businessmen that have just gone through a recession, our reserves are gone. My reserves are gone. I had reserves before the recession. Now I've got to put money from the savings account in to make payroll the past couple of years. And now you're asking me to pay $20,000 to interrupt my business and lose 30% of my business for maybe even two summers? I'd have, to, I'd have to argue this one all the way down, especially on a project that I don't feel is needed. You know, we don't need the, the lights, we don't need the talking intersections, we need left turn lanes at Hamlin, we need left turn lanes at Albert to keep a smooth flow of traffic going. And we need to be repaved. And that's all that I believe we need to do. I like to second it. I'm the neighbor right across the street to just open the gas station and spent a lot of money opening it. And you're just gonna choke the business right out of that place before it's just it. There's a lot of businesses on that street that are really going to hurt bad because of all of us, whether it's whether it's Tom at the copper room, whether it's him at Lucky's, whether it's me at Corey's, anybody is going to get hurt. And it's not just for those two summer periods. We've lost customers that are used to going somewhere else. They're not going to come back. That's the whole thing about this economy. If you lose a customer, it's really hard to get them back because there are so many options for all of us. And they, it'll be worse. They, they develop the worse. Oh, it'll be worse than the time. This thing, I think it's, uh, well, it's the first meeting. And we have 10 meetings from now. My opinion is not going to change. That this could, it could conceivably put me out of business. And I'm not saying it for fun. I'm not saying it to scare anybody. Because I'm the one that's going out. And I've got, you know, 62 employees at that store. Too. And it's just, uh, to do something that doesn't need, in my mind, to be done because there's nothing major that's happened, it, it is ludicrous. It's just asinine. And if it was your money and your business, you'd do the overlay and minimize the downtime to the people in the community. Well, I can tell you, I mean, I can tell you from the county standpoint, we don't feel like that's a good use of money on an overlay because we did it in 2002 and it's really needing it again. And so. I'm just explaining, I guess, our standpoint, you know. Reconstruction and an overlay for that same distance. And you got to have an idea, otherwise you wouldn't be calling reconstruction. What are your two prices, just like anybody else doing business? What is your price to overlay? What's it going to cost you? And what's it going to cost for reconstruction? It's got to be an increase of tenfold. And oh, at least a tenfold and increase in value. value. 15 years is still alive. Do you put any value on lost business or lost business income and the harm to the community? We do. We, we take, we're willing to work with you guys to minimize. First of all, this is the first open house. You're right. So we're here to hear what you have to say. We appreciate you coming. Yes. We are going to get the variance to say, can we make the roadway, if we reconstruct it, can we keep it the same width? That doesn't really make any decision about the project with respect to schedule or mill and overlay versus reconstruct. It just says, if we can reconstruct it, you know, in the same place it is today, then we'll get the go ahead to do that. If we don't get the variance, then maybe we will reconsider um, the scope because I personally don't have an appetite for ripping down 200 trees to widen the road two whole feet to get standards. I mean, that's something we would have to take a step back and say, is this worth doing? But to finish, you know, what I was saying about mill and overlay versus reconstruction, the city spent a lot of money the last several years, you know, fixing potholes on this road and a lot of other roads, frankly, that are county roads and city roads. So we're looking at the best investment for our money. 
um, which we believe is to reconstruct the roadway and to do the improvements that are necessary while they're in there, we're in there, not improvements that aren't needed, um, but to do the work that should be done so that it's done right, so that your road lasts you, you know, 40, 50 more years, not eight, with a whole bunch of money thrown at pick, fixing potholes. So that's, that's the county's standpoint. I'll take you down the road in 2017 and there'll be potholes. It's Minnesota, you can't get by without a pot. It's just as simple as that. Hot and, and cold. Um, how much of the entire project cost, which we haven't heard any numbers at this point, and I'm sure that that's very important because don't they always say follow the money? In any case, how much of this project's money is for uh, storm sewer new requirements and that sort of information. You talked about underground um, water gardens, etc. What again? What portion of the what percentage of the uh, project will go for those requirements? Um, we haven't done very detailed design at all on meeting those watershed district requirements. They're not even a quarter of a percent probably of the project. I mean, they're a very small portion, the actual underground storage to meet those requirements. Um, storm sewer wise, I'd have to do the math on what storm sewer will cost relative to the total project cost. But the cost of the project right now is in the transportation improvement program of the counties at about $7 million, which is for reconstructing, you know, 40 feet of pavement for over a mile. So you define a cost if you don't know what stuff costs. Because we know that big ticket costs are asphalt and asphalt costs. You said they're going to dig up the driveway. That would be some environmental issue, and the, and the cost will double, and it's going to come out of your height and my height, and and your customers' height. Right. I mean, if you had a bid, you'd have a bid. It would be broken down on here's what it's going to cost for drainage. Here's yeah, and I don't have a bid, so I have an estimate. Is it going to be a matter of public record? To yes, I mean, you can come to the bid opening if you want and see what the contractor did. Sir? I think the problem is, is uh, to do a big project like this and for you to qualify for federal, county, state, local, you got to do the big project. And so you, there's an urge to have to spend all of that money and to qualify for all of that money. And, it, and the only way you can do that and get some of that money is to go big deal versus, you know, uh, doing a satisfactory job and in our community without all of this business disruption. And I, I find that's the problem. You're trying to sell us the big deal, but that is our only option. We feel we have other options. And we're getting sold the big deal. Well, it's either reconstruct or it's major maintenance. So, I mean, those are our options. And you're right, you don't get state aid funds if you don't. I mean, there's reconditioning projects. There's um, standards for those projects I'm not as familiar with, but you're right. You know, we would use state aid funds if we reconstruct the roadway. We'd probably use, um, you know, gas tax dollars if we milled and overlaid the roadway. So um, I'm coming from the standpoint of saying we don't want to throw more money at milling and overlaying the road because it's not lasting as long as we'd like to see it last, and we don't feel like that is throwing good money after good. I would have to do the math for you because I don't know off the top of my head what it would cost to do mill and overlay. Because one of the challenges we have is what do we have out there for a pavement section today? Like I said, it's been milled and overlaid over time, and you know we have curbs. So whatever we mill, we need to overlay the same amount. Otherwise, we're you know our curbs are not at the right height. So we have some restrictions on how much of a major maintenance fix we could do. I'm just looking at St. Clair. I got a little store over on St. Clair here last year. They had St. Clair from Cleveland Snelling put a four inch, five inch, whatever. It was a pretty thick overlay down. And they did it in two and a half days. And they were done. They were gone. And that road is smooth as baby's bottom. And it, you know, it works like a champ. Works like a champ. We can, That's we can, based on feedback, we can look at what what we think of a, of a major maintenance fix, which would be, you know, a couple day kind of thing. 
a lot less disruption. Right. We can take a look at that and see whether we really feel like that would be the right way to spend Look, you your don't money. feel that way, and I'm just giving you my opinion of that's the way I feel. You know, you guys are going for the reconstruction. I understand where you're coming from, um, but it, we just can't have it. <laughs> his, his point about potholes is, is pretty valid. I don't know if you heard that, but this is Minnesota. Potholes happen. I mean, we're all yeah, but we do get lots of complaints, and there is a quality of life thing, too, with uh, potholes and a really bumpy road that nobody... What you do, you're going to have these potholes again. I mean, it's just going to come. You put it in a new school, you know, two years, you'll have potholes again. Not with a brand new roadway. You won't have potholes. Oh, 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 right. Are you using different yeah. types of materials? Yeah. Are they, you know, are they done tests with different types of materials to do an overlay? Um, and we've used the same type of asphalt to do an overlay. As a reconstruction. Well, there's research done on different types of oils and different sizes of aggregate and things like that. Is there a council member here? Who is the councilman? Um, Tolbert. Yeah, Tolbert and the board member would be um, Mr. Ortega. Are they here? <laughs> feel free to call your, I mean, call your representatives and let them know how you feel. I know. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know. I'm new here. We're, we're working at 1480 Randolph, and where we have a disproportionate demographic of older people. And if the gentleman is what it takes is $100 a foot, and whatever the number is, I just have to tell you, I'm going to walk that right into their rent. I don't have any choice. Okay? Yeah. So, the, so the folks, in the long term, are going to end up with that. Now, we've been busting our tail over here to put our best foot forward on a property that I felt was significantly unmanaged, and I think we're, we're putting our best foot forward. But the reality is that I don't know what's going to happen to the bus line out in the front there, but again, we're up there holding forward. So that's another question I have to pose. But the reality is, is in view of, of affordable housing, um, you're not doing anybody any favors. Is there anybody out here that feels like the roadway is in bad enough shape where they do want to see a fix that lasts longer than eight years? I mean, or does everyone feel that it can it can be? I mean, you don't have to answer, but I guess I'd like to know, you know, if everyone feels well, I think that way. Such a thing as Pennywise and Town Foolish. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know. Yeah, I would too. Well, ask a question. I don't think it's just businesses that are recovering from the session. I think Everybody's people in general. You know, and I always thought the city could generate a lot of money if they would have police officers ticketing speeding on Randall. My main concern is the safety of pedestrians and people. I mean, I myself had my house run into by a car. You know, and the traffic, I've been here since 95, and the traffic has gotten 10 times worse than it was. When did you say it was redone? 2002? Yes. Was the overlay? Yes. It's a letter to you. Well, what, like, what my question is, too, what the traffic monitoring and the speed levels. I know we have county and city, too, so, you know, that's that's an issue that I would bring forward in any case of construction of the safety. Ma'am, thanks. <laughs> Um, I want to ask the safety concern. I live, I'm the second house right after 35, after the bridge, you know, on the other side of the church. I know it says that it's an accident reduction area, but it's so dangerous there where those two lanes merge suddenly right in front of our the first three houses. We have no boulevard, so when the plows go through, everything comes on the sidewalk. That's a huge issue right there. But the safety issue, I've, there are so many near crashes. We hear breaks all the time, and we've seen crashes in our neighborhood. A car go into their house, and so are. So, am I understanding correctly that after this phase you're talking about, next will be improving 35 in Randolph, like for safety issues? And well, the project is on, is going to 35E, right? And we'll be improving pedestrian, right? Um, in, improvements at 35E and, and that's Randolph. A good thing so too. that's yeah. you know the the crosswalk that runs right into the six inch curve. Yeah. There on the west side of the intersection, um, the pedestrian ramps are not up to current ADA standards, so Americans with Disability Act standards. That is a good thing. And then we'll be also adding that APS and the um, countdown timers. I can't remember if those exist at that intersection no, or they're not, but. If not, we'll be adding them. Um, the other thing is, has there ever been impact studies on when the buses go by? We are so close to the curb, our house shakes. 
And I wonder, does that hurt our house? Does that hurt our foundation? Yeah, we haven't looked at that. Are you, you're in the block then between 35E and Lexington? Nope. Uh, Further? If you cross, if you literally cross 35, there's a bridge right there. There's Trader Joe's, then there's the bridge, and then the residential starts. Mm -hmm. We're the second house. Okay. So you're east of 35? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm so bad at direction, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, everything right in front of our house comes, and it's not clearly marked with painted lanes. There's not even room really to, for you to paint how these two come together. There's so many people are stopping to turn left on the 35 off of Randall, and the others are whipping around them, and there's so many, and some go straight and they almost crash. And well, that's it's not really in the bad. limits of our project, but we'll take a look at if there's some signing we can add there, or if there's different striping. Yeah, there's got to be something, because it's terrible. Well, but we can take a look at that. Thank you. I just want to piggyback on the previous two ladies about, um, it almost seems like Randolph has outgrown itself with the number of cars. I've lived on Randolph probably since 95 as well. And it's just amazing how um, I'm at Syndicate in Randolph and how the traffic is backed up past Hamlin, you know, during rush hour. And I also want to piggyback on the buses. My house also shakes. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, the buses repeatedly run over the curbs. Oh. So I'm thinking about cost benefit again because it is a major bus line. And for repairing curves, my curb doesn't exist because, you know, the buses are constantly running over it. So I think this is a really big issue to consider, too. Ma'am? We were just asking about people being interested in the project, and personally, I, we own two buildings on Randolph. We bought them just over a year ago. I, um, I know as an uh, organization, we are curious about what the improvements would be with the worry about, of course, how much they're going to cost us, but it feels to me that it's too early to even know what the costs are going to be. So personally, I would be wondering what the costs are going to be and we'd like to go for it just to see what that is. Um, but obviously it feels like we don't know all the details yet. So I think it's a little too early to poo-poo the whole idea without really knowing what it's going to be, personally. Well, we do a cost estimate just based on, you know, history of similar projects on what contractors are bidding for certain items. And obviously we have a contingency on that at this time since we don't know exactly um, the details of the design. Um, so I, you know, we do the best we can with cost estimating, but I do know that the city is going to set their assessment with, you know, with maybe other city projects in mind and, um, maybe information about sustainability of assessments for the types of homes along their project, but our project costs will not directly affect the city's assessment rate. I'd like to go back though, you said we're trying to get a cost benefit analysis of an overlay that can be done, say a week worst case scenario versus a decision that's obviously already been made. You said you couldn't make, you can't tell us the cost of the overlay, but you've made a decision on what the benefit is. How can you make that decision without comparing the numbers, number one. And if you look at it from a business perspective, not necessarily, you know, can we build a Super Bowl here when we can maybe give one by with just some better blocking attack. What are we gonna to get to see what those numbers are? And again, I'd like to pin you down to say, hey, there has to be some model when you punch all these numbers into it that says, hey, we're gonna harm some businesses and some of them might even go out of business. And do you put a value on that? I'd like to hear how you do that. You're not gonna tell me because you always avoid the question, but we're struggling here. In fact, that you're gonna my business thrives in the summer. In the winter we, we go everybody goes inside. You don't make any money in the convenience store business in the winter. So our revenue stream for the summer. And you're gonna choke me off for two years. And if I can stay open after a week, I can survive hardship for a week or two. Two years. And you say now they all oh, well, the plans are to do these things, I know how they'll go. And you'll close down the whole road and it'll be a disaster. And then you'll find all these cost overruns and there'll be this monumental expense at the end of the day and it's not my fault. And we're all gonna suffer. And then all those costs will get thrown over to the city and they'll assess it to the business people and the residents of the community. All I can say is it's engineering judgment to say that we believe it's not good money to throw an overlay on a roadway that has problems below the top of the pavement. So, and 
I will let you know that when it comes to business owners, I mean, I am not a business owner, but I know that there are implications for tax base when businesses go out of business. So I think you should let your council people know and your, your county board member know that you're feeling like this project will hurt you as a business and they talk to us. What kind of answer is that? I don't know what you just said. Well, I don't have a formula for how to factor in well, impact don't tell your business. Well, you these decisions, informed decisions, you, you, you didn't. I'm an engineer and I'm looking at the project from the This is the real world, okay? I understand that. No, I don't think you do. It's part of the problem. You don't understand. I concur with him. Okay. Yeah. Ma'am, in the purple, you've been raising your hand for a while. Yeah, I wondered why decorative lighting was part of this project because the decorative lighting that's on Hamlin from Grand to St. Clair is a very dark street. And I just don't know what decorative lighting has to do with this project. Especially when it doesn't give much light. It's the standard lighting in the city of St. Paul. Not as even in traffic engineering. Um, it is the standard lighting that is throughout the city of St. Paul. And it does illuminate in the pattern of uh, typical. If somebody wanted to do a lot of standard lighting, you could certainly look at doing something different. But it is not uh, so, uh, intended to, uh, it's to light the road. Does it save energy? Uh, we're not using any LED right now, but there are possibilities in the future of using a retrofit on that same. I think it would go a long way to add a cost benefit layer of information to this. I mean, if you're a homeowner and you've got a hot water heater and it's 28 years old and it's just going to be any month now that it's I mean, it could stay out for three months or three more years, but there might be some long-term benefit to A, doing something preemptively, and B, getting a hot water heater that's going to save you a lot of money in the long term. Where, the, where you draw the line on that, you know, is up to a cost-benefit analysis. To the gentleman's point here, there are just more information is better as this rolls along so that people have some sense of the fact that, you know, sometimes it's Pennywise pound tool, which is sometimes it's not. And that's where I mentioned the engineering judgment because it's a judgment call on what we're spending for repairing potholes and you know what's below that pavement on the road that we don't even know when it was built. Because it has been mil it has been overlaid and overlaid and overlaid so many times we don't have really good information on what the subgrade is and that's part of the problem. So the reconstruction would replace all of the subgrade soils which are part of the problem. So I'll take just three more questions and then we'll we can drill a hole. We have we have drilled holes. And you have found out what was under the the asphalt? It's layers and layers of old asphalt. Oh, and it's drilling, honey. I'll we'll take two more questions over here. Has this project been decided to uh, a major renovation of Randolph? Is this a decision that can be made yet? It's in our transportation improvement program as a reconstruction, which is a judgment call on engineering staff to say which roadways are okay, which roadways have a good subgrade to be milled and overlaid, and which ones will last. I mean, how long do we want our mill and overlays to last? We want them to last, you know, 15, 10 to 15 years. Have you secured money yet for this project? It's state aid funds, which yes, we have. Have you secured it? Yes. See, see, that's the bottom line. It's, 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 it's a pot of money top. that comes from gas tax now, money, and we spend it on the roadways. Well, that let me give you an example. Yeah. Jefferson Avenue had a bike uh, path rammed down our throat. That's where I live on Jefferson. Yes. And federal government had discretionary money of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars that they were going to give the city to develop this bike path, which is real nice. And then the city had to come up with $250,000. They felt obligated, the city did, because they had this, secured this $750,000 to, to spend $250,000 to make this bike path. So it comes down to, you know, you guys securing this money and you feel obligated to spend it. I understand what you're saying, and let me just clarify that county state aid funds are a pot of money that the county gets to spend on state aid roads. So the money for this project is not for Randolph Avenue only. 
Those funds that you're referring to are usually federal funds, sometimes state funds, which actually the county has given back federal funds before because it wasn't a good use of money. So I mean, we have made that decision within the last two years. We decided not to rebuild County Road B2 around Rosedale Mall because it was not a good investment, and we gave back $4 million. Do the citizens here have a chance to be, participate in major, to help decide if this should be a major uh, road construction of Randolph or a minor? Do we have a decision making that citizens and businesses- Can we vote on that? No. We're not gonna do a referendum on rebuilding Randolph or not, but we can take your input and we I've vote heard that before. Before. Come on in, sign a petition. The other thing is, it's important that this project, if it does go through, that it's only a year. The disruption is murder for the citizens, the residents, and the business people. Two years is, is impossible to sustain. It's unsustainable. And by the way, there's a barber shop on the corner of Randolph and Hamlin. Now picture him cutting hair. He just took two feet away from him and he's cutting hair, and here comes a bus. Yeah. That guy's gonna be bleeding. You know what I'm saying? Or, or how about the pancake house next door to the, uh, the uh, barber shop. There, uh, we were gonna put a nice sidewalk cafe there. Now two feet are gone, and uh, we'll be able to Give everyone a high five on the bus. No one likes left turn lanes at Hamlin. We won't pursue left turn lanes at Hamlin. I left turn lanes the whole project. I know, I know, but you're saying two feet, so I'm saying that's the two feet that I mentioned at Hamlin. We'll be flipping pancakes. Uh, the bus, the vibration from the bus is going to flip pancakes. <laughs> when was the roadway last reconstructed? I apologize. I it was overlaid in 2002. Do you know when it was last reconstructed? We don't even have it's, a date on when it was originally. It's more than 50 years or so. Oh yeah, it's and beyond its useful life. It's beyond its useful life, and so I'm a civil engineer as well. And we know, in my own judgment, a road can only last for so long, and you just start throwing money away. So when we talk about being responsible taxpayer money, I'm a taxpayer, I'm a lifelong resident just off of Randolph. I think it's important that we do the right thing with our money. We take the opportunity. I know there's short-term disruption. It's really intense. It's going to be a really intense disruption. But at some point, it's got to happen. It's the inevitable. There's other stuff below the roadway that needs to be improved. And uh, you know, we hear about vibrations from buses. That, that's a that's a thing you can't address with a mill and overlay. That's something that's got to be addressed with a road reconstruction. So uh, curb lines disappearing, you know, at some point that's got to be reconstructed. Everything underneath the road has got to be reconstructed. So I just want to make sure that everybody acknowledges or at least is aware that there's a lot of stuff here that I'm not going to belittle the, the impacts. Those are really big impacts, but at some point it just has to happen. But let me ask you something. Engineers are both posting the pain guys. Engineers are analytical people. Where do you live? Okay, analytical people look at numbers like they look at everything else and they'll say it's X dollars to do the project this way and it's Y dollars to do it this way. The street's not falling down. And I go around town and see them replacing roads all the time and they strip the surface up. You can't even tell us what the subsurface is so it's almost like let's dig it up to find out. Why can't you do it in a week or give us a number that says it's going to cost? Don't laugh, it's a real simple number. Tell me it's going to cost me X dollars a foot to do an overlay and it's going to cost me Y dollars a foot to dig it up and build a curve with decorated planks and let's see what we find at the bottom. Why don't we have a plan A, B, or C too? You said you're an engineer. Oh, but that goes analyst. back to what I said about a referendum on whether we rebuild the road. It is an engineering judgment. There is a useful life to a roadway. And at some point it needs to be reconstructed and we are here today to say now is the time. So I will certainly take what you're asking me and I can get m more information from you if you'd like some information about, you know, the cost benefit, what would it cost to mill an overlay, but we don't feel like that fix is going to last and we are using money from the public to do these things. So we do get scrutiny on, you know, why are you spending, I mean the county spends $800,000 a year on repairing potholes. That's county, that's money, that's public money. 
you know, fixing potholes. And no, we're never going to get rid of potholes in Minnesota, but we can make sure we're spending our money wisely, your money wisely, and put fixes on roadways that are actually going to last instead of an overlay that lasts eight years. And really, we want it to last 12 to 15. I keep saying, I ain't even told us it was 13 or right it's probably overdue to be reconstructed. But you're saying in eight years, it's not right. It's 12, 13 years. It depends on the condition of the roadway. If it's in poor condition today, then the roadway, everything that you do to it, is, is, it just gets worse and less effective. I disagree. I just, I don't know why you can't give us a number of what it would cost to do an overlay. That's a real simple question. You said you've done an analysis. Give us the number. I don't know the number. If I knew the number off the top of my head. analysis, ma'am. That's what I'm only asking you. How because it's two inches system? of asphalt, which, yes, has a dollar amount to it, but how long that lasts, I don't know that right now. But I do know the roadway is beyond its useful life. You can't take a roadway that was built 50 plus years ago and just keep overlaying it. So if you have, want to stick around and look at the layout or ask more questions or give me your contact information if you don't have answers to some of your questions will be around. Thank you.